Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hello, everyone, everywhere. Pastor Robert Thibodeau here. Welcome to Freedom Through Faith. Glory to God. It's a great day to be in the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise you, Jesus, for this wonderful day you've made. Oh, praise the Lord, folks. We are going to have a great time today. Hey, man, we're going to be talking about the laws of seed time and harvest. Oh, praise you, Jesus. Let's just go, Lord, with a word of prayer. I'm so ready to get into this Bible study today. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we come before your throne of grace and mercy, thanking you and praising you for all that you do. Hallelujah. Lord, we pray for this broadcast this day to go far and wide through the power of the internet, touching people's hearts and changing their lives. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you for your presence in the Holy Spirit this day as you lead and guide us through this conversation. And Father, to you, we give all honor, all glory, all praise at all times and all things in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. Hallelujah. Join me in our profession of faith, commonly referred to as the Apostles' Creed. Do this each and every week as we lay the solid foundation upon which we're going to build this Bible study today. Amen. Just repeat these words after me. It's out loud as if you're in a place where you can do that. If you're in a situation, you know, in a coffee shop or whatever where you, you don't want to do it, at least loud enough for your own two ears to hear the words you're saying. For faith comes by what? Hearing and hearing by the word of God. Amen. Just repeat after me. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate. He was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. Oh, but the third day he rose again from the dead. Hallelujah. And ascended up into heaven. And he's seated right now at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From where he will soon come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit. I believe the church is the body of Christ. I believe in the communion of saints. I believe in the forgiveness of sins. I believe in the resurrection of the body. And I believe in life everlasting. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Shout amen somebody somewhere. Have your Bibles. Turn to Galatians chapter 6. Galatians chapter 6. We're going to be talking today about the laws of seed time and harvest. Now, the whole world is governed by laws. We've talked about this before. There are the laws of gravity, the laws of electricity, the mathematical laws, laws of attraction, many other laws of the universe and the world as we know it. We've come to know and understand that these laws and principles are set because they've been tested by time. They do not change, and the results are always the same. Amen? And that includes the law of sowing and reaping. You've likely heard of this law a hundred times or maybe even more. You know, so often that you can quote it. Whatever you sow, you shall reap. That's a law. Whatever you sow, you shall reap. This law is not only universal, and it's been tested over and over again to be true, it, its origins can be traced to the Bible. Amen? Galatians chapter 6, turn over there with me. Galatians chapter 6, and we'll begin reading in verse 7 and go down to verse 10. Where are we at here? Right there. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man sows, that shall he also reap. For he that sows to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that sows to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. 
And let us not be weary in well-doing. For in due season, we shall reap if we faint not. As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially to them who are of the household of faith. Amen. Shout amen somebody somewhere. Praise God. One thing I've learned over the years of my ministry is where there is a universal or a time-tested law, it's best if you don't try and beat it because it is not going to break. It's because the consequences are good. They are good if you follow the law. If you break the law, it's not good. It, it, it never works to your benefit to break a law. Whatever you sow, you shall reap. This law is time tested. And many break it and feel they're just getting away with it or something. They just do not understand a concept of time. It takes time for seeds that are sown to grow. And then the crop shows up. This could take days, weeks, months, sometimes years. But when the crop grows from those seeds that were sown, whatever they were, good or bad, the harvest is going to come, either good or bad. What does this have to do with you and your life? <laughs> Everything. You see, the way you live determines the way of your life. If you are constantly reaping disappointment and despair and disruptions in your life, it's likely because you've only been sowing the seeds of discord, disputes, and degradation. Because you will 100% of the time reap what you sow. That's the law. Amen? Shout amen somebody somewhere. Oh, Brother Bob, you're preaching good today. Ah, yes, amen. Thank you. You know, if you've enjoyed good things more often than bad, sprinkled with joy and jubilation, look back. Just ponder your history and you will see it is always because those were the seeds you mostly sown. Another way to look at the law of sowing and reaping is to state it another way. Whatever you reap is because of what you have already sown. Ouch, Brother Bob, that hurts. Well, it was supposed to. If you don't like the crop that you have produced and it continues to produce for you, who do you look for to make a complaint? If you don't like a crop that's produced, there's only one person who planted it, and it's you. Using this analogy, it becomes clear if you don't like the crop that is being produced in your life, go to the next place that has a mirror and look in it. That's the person who's been responsible. Right there. It's you. You're the only one who can control the crop that comes from the seeds you plant. You are the only one. If you want tomatoes or cabbage, then don't plant peppers. If you do, you're going to reap peppers. If you want watermelons, plant watermelons. The law of sowing and reaping guarantees you will receive watermelons. Amen? Now, the measure of the crop and the amount of watermelons depends on how many watermelon seeds you plant and how well you tend to the garden as they grow. Did you see the key... The key to getting positive results is from the law of sowing and reaping. No matter what your belief system is, the law of sowing and reaping is always at work. Jesus himself used the marketing concept of storytelling, parables, and the process of how the principles of sowing and reaping work. His analogy was that of a farmer planting seeds and ultimately getting good results. And how it applies to a person's life, right? Matthew chapter 13. Let's, let's go over there. Matthew 13. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Let me turn over there. 
I wasn't planning on doing this, but we're going to do it anyway, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you for that. All right. Verse 1. Matthew 13, verse number 1. The same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat by the lake. Such large crowds gathered around him that he had to get into a boat and sit in it while all the people stood on the shore. And he told them many things in parables, saying, A farmer went out to sow his seed. Now, they can relate to that because this was an agriculture society. A farmer went out to sow his seed. Okay, this makes sense so far. As he was scattering the seed, some fell on the path. Yeah, yeah sometimes that happens. And the birds of the air came and ate it up. Yeah, yeah, we've seen that. Some fell on rocky places where there wasn't really much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. Yeah, yeah, we've seen that, yeah. And when the sun comes up, the plants were scorched and they withered because they had no root. Yeah, yeah, we've, we've, we've definitely seen that as we've been sowing, yep. Other seeds fell among thorns and bad ground, which was next to the good ground. But, you know, they popped up, but it... it the weeds choke the plants. Yeah, yeah, we we've we definitely experienced that, Jesus. Yep, yep. And then other seed fell on good soil, where it produced a crop a hundred, sixty, thirty times what was sown. I say, yeah, yeah, that's that's how you get your harvest, yeah. Well, whoever has ears, let them hear. Now, here's the golden nuggets that I want you to get from that story. First are the seeds that you plant. You have to start with good seeds. If you don't have good seeds, this crop will not be good for you. Amen. We know the farmer in Jesus' story had good seed because some fell on good ground where it produced a crop. 160, 30 times what was sown. Amen. Therefore, make sure that whatever seed you sow in whatever manner that may be, make sure it is good seed. Seeds of love, generosity, giving, serving, helping, supporting, encouragement, good leadership, praise God, mentoring, diversity, equity, inclusion, things that make a positive difference in the world to the, for the good of others as well as yourself. Those are the seeds you need to be sowing. So you have to have the right mindset and understand you have to understand this part, folks. Some of your seeds that you sow will not produce fruit. You just have to understand that. But you have to keep on sowing. Because the birds are going to get some and they're going to eat it up. Word says that even God takes care of the birds. They don't put food in a barn and all that, but he makes sure they eat. Some of that is from your seed. You're still feeding the birds. Amen. Because the birds are going to eat them before they can germinate or grow. What birds? Gossip. Discussion about other people. That's going to eat up your seed. But just keep on sowing anyway. Because some of your seeds will fall in rocky places of hate and envy and jealousy. There's no good soil there at all. But you just have to keep on sowing. Some of your seeds, the good seeds that you have, will be burned up by ridicule and rejection. Don't despair. Just keep on sowing. Some of your seeds will be choked out because of those who block your path. They put stumbling blocks in your way. They scheme for different ways to destroy you and trip you up. But just you just need to keep on sowing. Because some of your seeds will fall on good soil. It will prick the hearts of others and encourage them to do well towards you. It will rally somebody to help somebody else. It will turn a wayward life from the pathway of destruction and set them on the path of life and prosperity. Oh, praise God. You know, 
when I witness to someone and they seem indifferent or just outright reject what I'm saying, they reject the gospel, I don't get offended. I don't. I do not get offended. I don't keep pestering them, chasing them down the street, hitting them over the head with the Bible. I don't do that. I don't start yelling at them, you're headed to hell. I don't do that. The only thing I do when they reject what I'm sowing is to pray. Now, that doesn't mean I grab them by the collar and put my hand on their heads. I don't care if you want to hear it or not. I'm going to pray for you right now. I do not do that. I silently pray. Silently. When I witness to them, and I think, yeah, well, whatever. My first reaction is I pray silently. Lord, I planted the seed. Now you grow the harvest. And I leave it at that. I don't pester them. I don't bring it up. I walk away, whatever I need to do. I mean, you can look at it like this. The word in Genesis 8, verse 22, as long as the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night will never cease. When you witness to someone and you sow that word, it needs time to germinate. Yes, some people will receive it immediately. And you reach, you reap that immediate harvest. I've witnessed, I've experienced that, I've seen it, I've been part of services where that happens. And there are other times when you plant the seed and it may be months or years before you get word. They received Jesus as their Savior. Hallelujah. And it started with the seed. Amen. Let's go on. Otherwise, we'll be here all day. Amen. Genesis 8, 22. As long as earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night will never cease. I put it like this when it comes to witnessing. And it will apply to your sowing and reaping as well. There is seed... Now I'm taking Genesis 8.22. You can read it yourself right now. There is seed, right? He says, as long as the earth remains, seed, and put a hyphen right there. Time, put a hyphen right there, and harvest will not cease. When you sow a seed, financial seed, prayer seed, Witnessing seed. Anything you can call a seed. And then put a hyphen. Because the very next thing that has to happen is time. There is a time span involved before the harvest. But there will be a harvest. But from the moment of sowing the seed until the harvest is called time. You do not determine the time. God does. Amen? It could take months, years, decades, hours, minutes, or seconds. Amen? Don't shut me down when I'm preaching good. Glory to God. As sure as the corn seed produces corn, as sure as the wheat seed produces wheat, as sure as an acorn produces an oak tree, and only an oak tree, so the seed we sow in the field of life will always reap a corresponding harvest. The fact is we spend so much time of our lives dealing with the crops that have come from the seeds we've already planted. I want to consider some important things with you about the law of sowing and reaping and just how this truth plays out in our life each and every single day. And I hope it'll make more of us wise and careful farmers about what we're doing. The fact of sowing and reaping is as old as life on the earth. Genesis, way back in the book of Genesis, God established the law of seed, time, and harvest. Amen. When God supernaturally created the various forms of life, he set in place the natural laws of reproduction to take place. 
decreeing that each kind should multiply. Matter of fact, you can go back to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1. Praise the Lord. Okay. Oh, hallelujah. As you can tell, Brother Bob's very passionate about this subject. Amen. Genesis 11, Genesis 1, I'm sorry, verses 1 through 12. Let's try that again. Genesis 1, verses 11 and 12. Praise God. And God said, let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, the fruit tree yielding fruit after its kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth, and it was so. The earth brought forth grass and herb, yielding seed after its kind, the tree yielding fruit, whose seed was in itself after its kind, and God saw it was good. This law remains unbroken. We recognize it in the natural world. We never plant soybeans and reap corn. We would never plant potatoes and reap a harvest of wheat. The law of sowing and reaping is an unchangeable, immutable law of God. We understand, you know, a lot of people, well, that's just nature. Who created nature? God. It is just as much in, so in our life today. Paul even emphasizes this in Galatians 6, 7. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever you sow, you shall also reap. There is no evading this law. There's no bypassing this law. There's no way around this law. Science has never found a way around it. Every seed that we sow, there is eventually the fruit that comes from that seed. Not only naturally, this operates spiritually as well. Amen? Praise God. Hallelujah. Oh, let me take a break here for a second. Just, mm. Amen. If you have sown seeds that you realize now you do not want to reap a harvest on those seeds, then I recommend you pray. What are we going to pray for, Brother Bob? Pray for a crop failure. Hey, Amen. Don't shut me down when I'm preaching good. We need to remember that as we go through life, we're going to sow some bad seeds. It's just called life. Sometimes, as Paul suggests, we forget this and we get deceived by it. Sometimes we actually end up mocking God. What? Brother Bob, how do we mock God? We think we can sow one seed and reap another. It does not work that way, folks, especially in the spiritual realm. One of the reasons we are often deceived about sowing and reaping is because we forget some of the facts that pertain to a harvest. Paul stated unequivocally, we will always reap what we sow. Amen. It's just as true in your life as it is in your garden or out on your farm. Every seed brings forth after its kind. You cannot sow to the temporal and reap the eternal. You cannot sow to the flesh and reap things of the spirit. You cannot go through life living for the flesh and satisfying its appetites. Living for the world and the things of the world and reap a relationship with God and eternal life. And you cannot do it. This law is set, and it cannot and will not ever be changed. Second, you only reap what you sow. You, you reap more than you sow. Think about this. 30, 60, 100 fold. You reap more than what you sow. You... If you sowed a hundred dollars into a ministry, say I, I never received seed on that. It's because you just dug it up. God never forgets a seed that's sown. If it's a good seed, 
Now, you can go down to the store and, and purchase a bag of seeds. And you read it. It says, this is a tomato seed. These are tomato seeds. And you put them out in the de a dish and put them out in the shed. It gets hot out there. And, and, and a couple of years go by. You say, well, let me, let me plant these seeds now. There's a good chance they're not going to grow. Or if they do, it's just it's not going to be a good harvest because you let them die. When you take seed and you good seed and you plant it into good ground, it will grow a harvest. If you planted tomatoes, you're going to get tomatoes. But if you take that seed, leave it in the shed for a couple of years. And then try and grow it. It's not going to grow that much because you let the seed die. You let good seed die. Amen. How can I get this point across, Lord? The law is set. It cannot be changed. And you will only reap what you sow. But again, you will reap more than you sow. God said in the beginning to the plants of the field, the fish of the sea. The animals of the forest. He even said it to his man. Be fruitful and multiply. And from generation to generation, each race does not merely reproduce. It multiplies. Sometimes many years over. And you know, when I was young and back in high school, uh, I think there was like 1.2 billion people in the earth. Something like that. And I remember... Not many years after that, we hit 2 billion. And then several years later, we hit 3 billion. And I think right now, uh, don't get me wrong, I haven't looked this up for this this teaching, so don't get me right, don't get, don't write me emails saying, you messed that one up, because I don't know what the actual number is, but I believe I've heard it's over 6 billion now. Now, that's just in my lifetime. If you take what happened, you know, Thousands of years prior, when Jesus was talking, there may have only been a, a, I don't even think there would have been a billion people in, in the earth, maybe a couple hundred million. Look how fast seed has multiplied. That's the point I'm trying to get to. Amen? With each passing generation, the population increases. Plant a seed, it may produce many blooms or many stalks, many branches of fruit, and each one of those is producing their own seeds. Someone once said, you can count the apples on the tree, but you can't count the apples in the seed. Because each apple produces seed, but you don't know how many trees are going to come from that. Our seeds are reaching much farther than the original action, whether good or bad. Sometimes the fruit is born in the lives of other people from the seed we sow into their life. And whatever we sow spreads good seed or bad seed. It will reproduce. Hosea chapter 8 verse 7, For they have sown the wind and now they reap the whirlwind. It has no stalk. The, blood she, the bud shall reed, reap no, uh, yield no meal. If so be it yields, strangers will swallow it up. This goes back to what Jesus taught as well. They get more than they bargain for, basically. A man named Albert Barnes explained this passage this way. They shall reap not merely as they have sown, but with an awful increase. They sowed folly and vanity. They shall reap not merely emptiness and disappointment, but sudden and irresistible and unstoppable destruction. That's how it is. That's how it operates always, 100% of the time, with sin and evil. Thirdly, we shall not, we, we not only reap what we've sown, we reap more than what we've sown. That's the harvest. But we will reap and always reap after we've sown. And sometimes you forget about the bad seed you've sown. But when that harvest comes in, you think, you're you trying to figure out, wow, why did this happen? Because of seed you've planted before. No seed, no seed yields instantaneous fruit. 
but it takes time for that seed to germinate and yield whatever it is going to yield. It could be a few days, maybe weeks, months, maybe even years. Since the consequences of our actions are the same, we are sometimes deceived into thinking that the good we do is for nothing because you don't see immediate results. You know, I sold $100 into that ministry expecting to get at least 30-fold. I ain't got nothing yet. Well, you just dug up your seed. <sighs> we've gotten away with the wrong that we've done when you did something stupid and so discord or did, did something. You will reap that harvest. You think you may have gotten away with it because you did not immediately get punished for it. Just on the news recently, uh, Tupac Shakur, whatever his name is, was murdered back 1997 or 92, something like that. I don't remember now. The guy who ordered the hit was arrested just this week. Talk about thinking you got away with it. Nope. He ended up getting arrested for the murder. And now he's going to pay the price. You think you get away with it, but you don't. You will reap a harvest. Ecclesiastes chapter 8, verse 11. Because sentence against an evil work is not exalted speedily, therefore the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. They think, ain't nothing going to happen to me. But they are wrong. Sometimes they end up dead for retaliation or whatever. Right? In fact, this is what we are witnessing in the United States right now every single night on the evening news. Think about a few years back. Think, just think about this. All the riots that were taking place all across America. And all the liberals wanted to abolish the police departments, defund the police. And that happened. They changed the laws to set no bail for criminals, just early release. Let them out. And then they changed the laws for early release dates for those that were in prison. I mean, we had someone here in Baltimore area since the 30 years for murder or whatever, rape and murder and all that stuff. 30 years. He was out in seven and then committed two more murders. And they arrested him again. You reap what you sow. Crime's out of control. Police departments are way understaffed. Unable to respond quickly to crimes being committed because they're just short-handed. And when arrests are made, the criminals are released right back out on the streets because the courts cannot hold them by making them pay bail out of their own pocket anymore because the laws have been changed. They can only follow the law. What is happening now in those cities are, is a direct result of the seeds that were sown a few years back. They're experiencing the harvest on the discord they sow. Amen? Ah, oh, don't shut me down when I'm preaching good. Glory to God. So let's not be deceived into believing we will never reap what we've sown. You will reap more than you've sown. You re will reap it later than you've sown. The Bible promises all three. Human experience testifies to this age-old truth. We could make many positive applications on this principle that'd be well worth our time, but today I want to focus on the warning that is seen and sowing and reaping. We may as well pull our heads out of the sand and realize that the places we often find ourselves in life are because of the seeds we have sown before. This should either cause us to repent of the sin that we've committed or avoid sowing the bad seed to begin with. Amen? We will always reap what we sow when it comes to the choices we make. Life is simply a series of choices. It's a combination of choices. Every single waking hour, you are making choices. I'll make one right now. Take a sip of coffee. 
That was a choice. Some choices you do not consciously stop to think about. Those choices have a result. They have a consequence. Whether the choice is big or small, it will not be without some kind of effect. Guaranteed. It's sobering to think about the power that our choices have in our lives and the lives of others, isn't it? Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse 26, 27, and 28. Behold, I set before you this day a blessing and a curse. A blessing if you obey the commandments of the Lord your God. By obeying the blessings and the commandments of the Lord our God, we are sowing good seed. He says, and a curse if you will not obey the commandments of the Lord your God. That's the bad seed. To turn aside out of the way which I command you to follow. To go after other gods which you have not known. Deuteronomy 30 verse 19, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Choose life that you and your seed may live. There's that word again, seed. You plant good seed, living seed. You plant good seed and you and your seed shall live. You see, the choices we make and what will be the most important thing to us, who our companions are, who our spouse will be, how we will raise our children, where we live, how we make our living, all of these incredibly important decisions that will have an impact way, way down the line into the future. Some of them will determine how we live for the remainder of our life on this earth. If we make the wrong choices, we will pay for it for a lifetime. Even more sobering, many of the choices we will have impact our eternity. The choices and decisions that you make this very day as they relate to your soul and the souls of those around you that you love and have the most influence over will have an impact on where you and perhaps they spend eternity forever. Do you ever stop to think about that? A simple choice you make today for you or your family will we'll put them on a trajectory toward heaven or hell. The book of Ruth is a great example in this, folks. It tells one of the most wonderful, touching stories of the whole Bible. A story of love and devotion and redemption. It also around, revolves around some choices, good and bad. The, 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 it changed their destinies forever. Quite a few people. Think about it. Chapter 1 begins with the story of Elimelech and his wife Naomi, a Hebrew couple from Bethlehem, Judah. They made a terrible and faithless decision when drought and famine gripped their homeland. They made the decision to leave the land of God and move themselves and their two sons to the godless heathen land of Moab. <clears throat> and as bad as things might have been in Bethlehem, Judah, it was a foolish thing to go to Moab. The Moabites were the declared enemies of God. It was a dark place filled with idolatry and evil. I don't think they ever intended to live like the idolaters of Moab or to participate in the evil that went on there. But it seems that they simply went there because of physical and financial concerns. If you know the story, they paid a terrible, terrible price. Three of the four members of that family, Emelech and both of his sons, died right there, leaving Naomi all alone. She came home 10 long years later, heartbroken, financially destitute, ruined with bitter regrets, all because of a choice Emelech made because he was the head of the household. He seemed to be more worried about what they were going to eat 
than being in the will of God. Oh, that sounds like a lot of people today, doesn't it? Oh, yeah, don't shut me down when I'm preaching good. It may be you. Amen. Well, as a result of that choice, they lost everything. Then there's Ruth, Naomi's daughter-in-law, whom she gained in that country, who then made the decision to return from Moab with her. To leave her family, to leave her culture, to leave all that she knew behind, to follow Naomi. And somewhere along that dusty roadside, perhaps near the border, Naomi was finally making her way back home. And Ruth had made a choice to follow her. Naomi decided to turn, or Ruth decided to turn her back on everything and everybody in her life at that point, to leave it all behind to follow her mother-in-law to a land known as the land of God. With that one simple decision, a decision she made in faith to trust, to live among God's people, changed her destiny and changed the entire destiny of Israel. Even the destiny of the church we have today. Think about that. One decision by a woman who had no relationship with God to follow God. Oh, praise God, don't shut me down when I'm preaching good. We have reaped eternal rewards because of the choices she made by the side of the road. I hope you remember that as you look into the faces of your husband, your wife, and your little children as you make choices today that seemed insignificant. Young person, if you're listening to me right now, be it live or recording, as you chart the course of your life, choose very carefully. Point two, we reap what we sow when it comes to the deeds we do. Sometimes we think our lives are just left to chance. But I suggest that nothing really happens by chance. Rather, everything happens. Everything that happens is the reaction of some other action. Ralph Waldo Emerson said the the law of cause and effect was the law of all laws. It's the third law of Sir Isaac Newton's laws of physics. I believe it anyway that every action has an equal and opposite reaction. Really, that's not Newton's law, but God's law. That's what he established. Newton just discovered it. It's not only the truth in God's physical universe, but in his spiritual world as well. Whatsoever a man sows, that is what he shall reap. Moses told the people in Numbers 32, you can be sure your sin will find you out. That's verse 32, 23, I think it is. You can take that to the bank. Solomon, the wisest man that ever walked the earth who certainly knew what he knew by inspiration, spoke and said this, Proverbs 13, 15, Good understanding gives favor, but the way of transgressors is hard. You cannot sin and get by with it. I want to repeat, you can never sin and get away with it. There will always be a consequence somewhere, sometime, and somehow for sin. A life of dissipation and wantonness will eventually yield bitter fruit somewhere that you will not enjoy. The shores of time are littered with countless shipwrecks, lives ruined by immoral and godless living. And sin may come home to roost in your body and physical disease or disability or some kind of addiction, a broken family liver problems, VD, mental emotional problems, lost children, it doesn't matter. Sin exacts a price that you don't see when it all seems like fun and good times. But mark it down. The piper will be paid. Amen. It may not show up today. You may think you got away with that sin, but you may think you're wiser than God and you can get away with it with no consequences. 
but you can't. The seed will produce in time. That's a, there's a haunting scene revealed to us in Ezekiel chapter. I love Ezekiel. It involves the priests of Israel engaging in idolatrous worship. Think about it. This was a vision that God caused Ezekiel to see concerning the state of the people of his time. In the vision, they had taken their wicked rituals behind closed doors into the cover of darkness. Ezekiel chapter 8, verse 7 through 12 says, And he brought me to the door of the court. When I looked, there was a hole in the wall. And he said to me, Son of man, dig now in the wall. And when I dug in the wall, behold a door. And he said to me, Go in and look at the wicked abominations they're doing here. So I went in and saw, and behold, every form of creeping things and abominable beasts and all the idols of the house of Israel portrayed on the wall round about. And there stood before them 70 men of the ancients of the house of Israel. In the midst of them stood Jezaniah, the son of Shepan, with every man his censer in his hand. A thick cloud of incense was going up. That's the prayers. When God said to Ezekiel, son of man, have you seen what the ancients of the house of Israel are doing in the dark? Every man in the chambers of his imagery? For they say, the Lord does not see us. The Lord has forsaken the earth. Oh, oh, oh. oh were they mistaken. Obviously, the Lord did see them. And there was a reckoning coming. For Ezekiel goes on to predict their bloody and fiery doom. There is no getting away from God. There's no hiding from God or getting away with sin. There's no sinning with impunity. The wisest thing to do is just repent of your sin and God will forgive you. Yes, there will be consequences in this life as a result of the foolish and rebellious choices that we make. That's because of the immutability immutability of the law of sowing and reaping. You cannot get away with it. You cannot undo what has already been done. But God is merciful and willing to forgive. Isn't it better isn't it better to wisely avoid the things that only bring ruin and destruction into our lives? Isn't it better just to of the lives if we just stop doing that, of those we often claim to love? If you're living in sin right now today, I want to urge you to repent because you're planting seeds and you will reap what you are presently sowing. Three, we reap what we sow when it comes to the attitudes we show. Perhaps we're deceived about this as much as anything else. We just don't seem to see how our attitudes and our actions towards other people eventually get turned back on us when we're the ones who get into trouble or when we're the ones the object of scrutiny. All of us are going to get into trouble at some point in life. Someone we're connected to is going to let us down or get involved in something that makes them the object of criticism, scorn, brings embarrassment and disappointment to them and to us. You can mark it down. If you don't mess up at some point in your life, your spouse, your children, your parents will. When that happens, we usually want people to be as merciful and generous as possible with us, don't we? And while the people of God can never condone sin or look the other way when evil is committed, as though there's nothing wrong with what's going on, we would hope that when scandal enters into our home or into our life, people will be concerned enough about us and love us enough to try and help us get back up and not merely condemn us and walk away. But if you're going through life steeped in pride and self-righteousness, if you look down your nose and display an indignant, indifferent, holier-than-thou attitude towards others, if you gossip about other people's sins and display a, a, a harsh, condescending attitude towards others, when they're down, you are sowing seed that one day you personally will reap. Matthew chapter 5, verse 7, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Luke 6, 35, 36, 37, Love your enemies, do good, lend, hoping for nothing again, and your reward shall be great. You shall be children of the highest, for he is kind to the unthankful and to the evil. Be ye therefore merciful, 
as your Father is also merciful. Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you shall be forgiven. This is often misunderstood. It doesn't mean that we turn a blind eye to sin and refuse to rebuke sin or shun the influence of sin. No, no, not at all. It does affect how we deal with the sinner. It means we show compassion, a compassionate spirit towards them, reaching out to help them and lift them up instead of knocking them down. It means we apply the same standard and the same treatment that we would hope to receive and should be applied to us. We should be as gentle and entreating as we want others to be with us. The person who stands before God and says, I'm thankful I'm not like one of these sinners, is not the one who will stand before God justified, just as Jesus said in Luke 18. The Pharisee stood and prayed like this with himself, God, I thank you that I'm not as other men are, extortioners and unjust, adulterers, or even that I'm not like this publican over here. I fast twice every week, God. I give tithes of all I possess, God. This publican standing far off, he would not lift so much as eyes into heaven. He just beat on his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I'm telling you, Jesus said, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other one. For every man that exalts himself and brags on what he's done shall be abased. He that humbles himself shall be exalted. You need to watch your traditions. You need to watch your relations to those about us to remember that we will reap what we have sown. The rod we use to beat others can just as easily be turned and beat us. The standard we apply to others will be applied to us. God forbid we justify sin like many people are doing right now. God help us to love these sinners enough to lead them to cavalry and the Lamb of God who can take their sin away. We've dealt with much of the negative aspect of sowing and reaping today. You may have thought this was going to be one of them prosperity messages, but I turned the tables on you, didn't I? You may be dealing with consequences of choices in your life right now. You also know you can plant seeds in the garden of life this very day. They will reap a, hoppus, a, a harvest of just the opposite. You can plant the seeds of gossip, obedience, and faith. I'm sorry, gospel obedience and faith, not gossip. You plant seeds of gossip, you're going to be talked about. That's what gossip is. But if you plant the seed of gospel obedience and faith and reap an eternal uh, eternity of joy and reward in the presence of God Almighty himself, you can know the peace and the forgiveness of your sins. You can know the friendship of God. He will help you in the struggles you may be dealing with right now in your life as a result of the seeds you have already sown. Whatever you sow today will come back to you because of the law of reciprocity. What goes around comes around. Your job is simply to keep sowing good seed. Financial seed, relational seed, supernatural seed. Amen. Here's a point of reality. You could lose a crop along the way. Oh, yeah. Amen. Amen. So we get ready to close. I bet that's something you weren't expecting from me, was it? Sometimes a farmer does everything right. A beautiful crop is being produced, and just before they're ready to harvest it, a hailstorm comes or a powerful, powerful rain or flood, wind, whatever, and destroys the farmer's entire crop. That can happen. That can happen in your life, too. Sometimes no matter how well you perform or how much you've produced, it will not be appreciated and nothing good appears to come from it. I have a word of encouragement for you. Don't despair. The law of sowing and reaping has not changed. If you keep sowing with good seed, another crop will be produced. The only way you can be defeated and not benefit from the law of sowing and reaping is to stop sowing. If you don't sow, you don't reap. Let me say that again. If you do not sow, you will not reap. What you sow is what you reap. It is 
a universal law that never fails. Whatever your circumstances are right now, you can change them. It is entirely in your hands. Nobody can plant your seeds for you. They are your seeds. It's up to you to sow them. If you want a good return on the investment in your life, sow good seeds regardless of the condition of the ground that's in front of you. Jesus says, sow in all those grounds, you will reap a harvest. The seed will find some good ground somewhere and the law of reciprocity will return a good crop. Nobody is left out. Anyone can sow and reap. The question is whether you will do it. Change your mindset. Change your life. Let me leave you with this thought as we get ready to close. If you're saying right now, I just don't have anything to sow. I have bills and debts, etc. And I just don't have anything right now. I need a financial harvest just to get started. I don't even have enough money to pay my light bill. Well, if you're looking, let, let's say your light bill is 100 bucks and you only have 20 and you keep it in your wallet. Is your light bill going to be paid? No. Jerry Savelle, when I was attending his Bible school almost, gosh, 25 more years ago, says something that has stuck with me ever since I heard it. He said, if what is in your hand does not meet your need, then it must be a seed. Let me say that again. If what you have in your hand right now does not meet your need right now, then it must be a seed. What you do with the seed will determine your harvest. If you eat your seed, what will you harvest? Nothing, because you planted nothing. If you keep your seed in the barn and do not plant it, in this case, you keep it in your wallet or your purse, what will be your harvest? Nothing, and your bill is still not paid. But if you sow it, it can become a seed and will produce a harvest. Amen, Jesus said so. It will produce a harvest of the same kind of seed you've sown. If you have a financial need, sow a financial seed. If you have a physical need, sow a physical seed. Do something you haven't been able to do before and give it to God. A seed will produce after its own kind. I'm all out of time for today. Praise God, hallelujah. If that's you, you can go to our website, evangelismradio.com and you'll see a donation tab right there. Sow a seed right now. We receive it in the name of Jesus. If you have a question, well, let's just pray. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray for the people listening right now that this message touched their hearts and they know the intent with which it was sown to get them back with you. To you I give all honor, glory, and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. That's all the time we have for today. Until next time, Pastor Bob reminding you, be blessed in all that you do.